Hello, and thank you for joining me today for another presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series sponsored by Tamron. I'm Tim Gray, and today we're going to be talking about common mistakes for photographers to avoid. Essentially, looking at some of the mistakes that I've made as a photographer over the years and mistakes that I see a lot of other photographers making as well. And the idea, of course, is to learn from those mistakes for all of us to become better photographers. So, I'm Tim Gray. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with me as the author of the Ask Tim Gray email newsletter. I suspect many of you are getting that email in your inbox every day. Thank you very much for letting me into your inbox, and I hope you find those emails helpful. If you're not getting those emails, you can visit asktimgray.com and check it out and sign up to get those emails. There's also a weekly option if you prefer just a weekly summary of the questions and answers. So here we're looking at a picture of myself with a horse. This is actually, I suppose, a, a mini lesson. A uh, mistake to avoid is not getting to know your subject, or, you know, we know the mantra of know thy subject, but also making a connection with your subject. And here, in the Pyrenees Mountains of France, because I made friends with this little horse, I was able to go around and photograph some of the horses up at the mountaintops there. Lots of fun. I want to also quickly thank Tamron for sponsoring today's presentation, making today's webinar presentation possible. Do check out their One Location, One Lesson, One Lens series on YouTube, youtube.com slash tamronvids, and in the near future you may very well see me featured in one of those videos. I also want to mention that I just returned from the Palouse region of eastern Washington state. I had a wonderful time. We had two back-to-back -back workshops, and it was a great deal of fun. Lots of great images were captured, and so you'll notice a lot of photos from the Palouse. In fact, most of today's presentation will feature photos from the Palouse just because I've been having so much fun going through pictures from this year as well as from prior years. If you find those photos appealing and you'd like to go out and capture some of the same types of images with me next year, we have set dates for 2019. You can get those details at timgrayphoto.com, but we'll have two sessions, two workshops in June of 2019 if you'd like to join me. All right, so let's dive in to some of those common mistakes that I see a lot of photographers making and hopefully helping you to avoid those mistakes, to be aware of those mistakes so that you can avoid them. One of the key mistakes, I think, is photographing for other people, focusing too much on what you think other people want to see in your photos rather than just focusing on your own feelings, your own thoughts as a photographer. This story, this photo, many of you might have heard the story over the years. I've shared this image on a number of occasions. And I would present it as one of my favorite photos. And of course, as soon as I showed it, you could sense the reaction in the audience that they weren't necessarily impressed with this image. And that's reasonable. That's fair. This actually is an image. This was really just a test capture. I had gotten the Lens Baby lens a long time ago. This was with the original Lens Baby. And I was playing around with it, testing things out, and trying to get a feel for it. it. Happened to me in Santa Monica. Well, it just so happens I was born in Santa Monica. And this is the sign over the top of the Santa Monica Pier. I spent a lot of time with my grandmother there, building sandcastles in the shade of the pier, and going on the amusement park rides, playing in the arcade, etc. And so this photo took on a special meaning for me personally. So I really love this photo, even though I wouldn't really describe it as my best image or the technically best capture, etc. But again, the key is to focus on your own photography. Focus on what inspires you as a photographer and try not to worry too much about what other people think. Yes, certainly get critiques and get input on your images and take that to heart, but shoot for yourself first and foremost. I think one of the biggest mistakes, one of the things that I hear a lot and it really kind of bothers me a little bit, is I'll fix it in Photoshop. Now there's no question that Photoshop and other software tools provide incredible power for optimizing the appearance of our photos. And so if a photo has a problem, I'll absolutely fix it in post-processing, whether that's with Lightroom or Photoshop or some other software altogether. But in the field, I want to try to make the best of the photo. Now, if there's dust spots on my sensor and I don't know about it till later, obviously I couldn't have necessarily done anything about that unless I had known about it or checked for those dust spots. 
but blemishes and other distractions. So here, for example, this red barn, late afternoon light, you might not be able to tell, but if you look closely, maybe you can see there are a couple power lines going across the sky. Now, to be sure, with something like Content Aware in Photoshop, that would be a pretty easy fix. We could just paint across those power lines and they would magically disappear. But I'd rather try to get the best photo possible, and sometimes exploring those possibilities might give us a better photo. So here, for example, if you walk closer to the barn, those power lines shift overhead and now you've got more of a clear shot of the barn with no power lines in the shot. Or you might notice a photo within the photo as you look at this image. I could essentially zoom in or get closer to the barn, tighten up my composition so that those power lines are no longer an issue at all. And in the process of exploring a shot without the power lines, I might find something that I like a little bit better. So when it comes to blemishes, you know, you've got a branch sticking in the frame, power lines in the frame, something that you think is a little less than ideal, it might be worthwhile, in fact, I would encourage you to try to find a vantage point, a way to exclude that distraction or blemish from the frame, rather than just always assuming that you'll fix any blemishes after the fact. Another thing that I see a lot of photographers doing, and I'm sure especially early on in my photography a career, if you will, I was doing the same thing, and that's photographing from the first spot. And what that means is you're wandering around, perhaps, you see an interesting subject, you stop, you raise the camera up to your eye, or you set it up on the tripod, and that's where you capture that subject from. That's where you capture the photograph from. Wherever you happen to be standing at the time, and at eye height or tripod height, without varying things up. And I find tremendous value in spotting a subject, and then if possible, I know sometimes subjects are moving fast and you need to react quickly and, and get your shot as quickly as possible, but when the circumstances allow it, to contemplate, why is it that I'm drawn to this subject? What is it about this scene that is particularly compelling? In other words, what makes me want to capture a photo of this scene? and then sort of emphasizing those attributes. So here, I love this tree, the clouds are interesting, and I also love that there's a wheat field. This is out in the Palouse, it's farming country, especially wheat and other crops, and so I want to incorporate that wheat, perhaps. Well, maybe I can find a better vantage point, a better angle. Maybe if I get down lower, for example, I could emphasize the wheat just a little bit. Maybe from a different angle, I've got better clouds off in the distance. And so, in this case, for example, going and finding a little bit of a different vantage point, going around the corner, essentially, getting down low to really emphasize that wheat in the foreground, and then otherwise filling the frame with the tree. So, finding ways to improve our vantage point, being able to make changes to how we're photographing, where we're positioning ourselves, more to the point, where we're positioning our camera, maybe even thinking about lens choice, etc. When it comes to that perspective, also sort of neglecting unique perspectives. So this is the World Trade Center Tower in New York City, and of course it's an interesting building, it's an iconic building, and we would tend to photograph such buildings from a bit of a distance, but what about finding other options? So here, because of the shape of the building, for example, if you get really close and point your camera almost straight up, the building seems to form a pyramid because of the I suppose you could call them facets on the sides and corners. And so just finding unique perspectives. It doesn't always have to be just an odd perspective, but trying to find a unique way of looking at a subject that'll make it a little bit more interesting to the viewer. Another common mistake, and, and with good reason, but putting the sun behind you always. Now, to be sure, as a general rule, we want to put the sun behind us so that the sun is illuminating the subject in front of us. We've got direct lighting, or maybe we're off to the side just a little bit, so we have some quartering lighting, maybe even side lighting, but sometimes going the opposite. So when I'm thinking about subjects, and maybe you've had this experience as well, I'll often think of them as morning versus afternoon subjects. And so a subject that is facing west might be an afternoon subject because the idea is we want to photograph it when the sun is getting close to setting, essentially, so that we're able to have the light of the sun illuminating the subject. But that's not always the best shot, or at least it's not the only shot. So taking a, an afternoon subject, a subject that will be illuminated by the sun in late afternoon, and instead going out to that same subject at sunrise. So here, putting the sun behind the subject, 
and including the sun in the frame, this happens to be an HDR capture so I could retain more highlight detail, but in other words, varying that angle to the sun, not always trying to get the sun behind you. And in fact, there's a variation on that concept in the next shot. The topic is different, but one of the other mistakes is not waiting for better conditions. I can't tell you how many times I see photographers showing up at a location, capturing an image, and leaving before all the really good light happens. So here photographing from the top of Steptoe Butte, and I would see photo photographers come up to the top, capture a few images, get back in their car, and leave, and they didn't wait. If they had just waited another half an hour, they would have had much better conditions. And so in this case, actually pointing toward the sun, but not having the sun in the frame so that we get that illumination, that backlighting from the sun. And with the dust and haze in the atmosphere, there's a good chance then that we could get some color in that light. And so just by waiting here early in the process of the sun starting to go down late afternoon to be sure, but not quite late enough, waiting just a little bit longer as the sun gets closer to the horizon then we'll see that there's a lot more color. We're getting sort of that sunset color, but without the sun actually in the frame. So pointing the lens toward the sun, but keeping it down below the horizon so that we're taking advantage of the backlighting on the haze here in this case, the dust up in the air. So waiting until those conditions get better. Many of you I'm sure are familiar with this notion of photographing after the sunset as opposed to right at sunset in that very often, the sky looks much better about 20 minutes or so after sunset than it did right before sunset. So just because the sun has gone down below the horizon doesn't mean that you should just give up, you know, that, that you shouldn't wait around a little bit longer and possibly see some more interesting light available to you for that landscape or whatever it is that you're photographing. I also find that, you know, photographers have a tendency, and this is a tricky thing when I'm leading photo workshops, actually, is to encourage photographers to go beyond just the area that I may be showing them to some extent. And so I had a, an experience with this in Rome that was sort of interesting and, and led to a photo that I'm very happy with. So when I lead photo workshops in Rome, of course, we're kind of planning a path that will take us by some interesting subjects and timing that walk or that journey so that we'll have good lighting conditions, you know, late afternoon light, for example. But then there's a need, in, in addition to going down that path, to trying to explore little side nooks, little areas beyond the path that we're taking. And it's one of the things I enjoy most with photo workshops is when photographers uh, sort of get lost a little bit, when they venture off the beaten path just a little bit, go check out a little side street. So here in the Trastevere neighborhood of Rome, one of my favorite areas to wander around and photograph in Rome, a beautiful little piazza. You can see the buildings here, very typical buildings with the color shutters, etc. A shadow being cast by another building nearby across that makes an interesting angle. But this is in plain view. Anybody who goes and visits this piazza is going to see this view. But then just around the corner, down this little, it almost looks like an alleyway. It doesn't look like the, the best street to just venture down. But you go around the corner, and then I found this wonderful door with this ivy hanging down, the plant hanging down. And I thought it was just a beautiful scene. And I photographed it. I was very happy with the image. And I thought, boy, if I hadn't just ventured off and gone to find some other angle, gone to find something else altogether off the beaten path a little bit, I would have missed this photo. And so just trying to always remember, let me check and see what else is nearby. In the Palouse, for example, very often, you know, we go to photograph a red barn and one or two of the photographers will venture off in the completely opposite direction, the wrong direction as it were, but then they find something else and they capture unique photos and it's just wonderful. So trying to make sure that you're always looking around you, sort of that advice I've talked about in the past of, you know, looking behind you, don't just focus on your key subject, but turn around and see what else is nearby. You might find another great photo just around the corner. I also find that it's important to really understand your gear. And so here, for example, with this image, depth of field preview. I think most digital SLRs today, most digital cameras that a serious photographer might use, including mirrorless cameras, give you that option to be able to see a depth of field preview. So with an SLR, for example, when you're looking through the viewfinder, the lens aperture is always wide open. 
And so if you want to see the impact of lowering that setting of essentially stopping down the lens aperture to a smaller diameter so that you get more depth of field, but how much more? You just press that depth of field preview button, or even better, use live view in conjunction with the depth of field preview button so that you can actually see the effect more easily. And that's just one example. So do you know what all the buttons on your camera actually do? And very often I find photographers don't know what certain buttons do on their camera, or they didn't even know a button existed. They might not have even noticed that there was a depth of field preview button hiding down there by the lens. And so, number one, becoming familiar, but then also, one of the ways I describe this is, could you adjust all of the controls on your camera reasonably well with your eyes closed? Or while you're only looking through the viewfinder so that at least you're able to monitor the settings such as the lens aperture, shutter speed, ISO setting, could you, without taking your eye away from the viewfinder, manipulate those buttons, press the buttons and turn the dials that you need to adjust the settings that you need to adjust while you're capturing an image? And it's not, of course, that that's necessary because you can pull your eye away from the viewfinder generally, and if you've got good lighting conditions, if it's reasonably bright out, you're not photographing at night, you'll be able to see all those buttons, and so what do you need to be able to find them without looking at them for? Well, it's really just more of that familiarity, so knowing that you're able to accomplish that, to be able to adjust those settings, to really understand your gear and how it works and where the buttons are and what they do, etc., if you've not done that, I really encourage you, take your camera out and have a good look at it. I'll bet you're, there's a good chance you could find at least one button on that camera that you were not familiar with or that you don't use and don't necessarily know what it actually does. So spending a little bit of time to get more familiar with your gear will help ensure that you're able to work more quickly, more expeditiously, more confidently out in the field when you're capturing images. But also, sort of going in the other direction, I suppose you might say, is focusing a little too much on the gear. Which lens are you using, and what's the minimum uh, aperture setting, and you know, all these different technicalities, certainly important. But don't focus too much on the gear. I very often, when I'm using a particular piece of gear, I'll have a photographer ask me you know, how I like that gear. And it, to me, it's always a slightly funny uh, question, because I feel like, it's working, it's doing the job. And I know part of that is, do you think that lens is sharp enough, for example, or you know, do you think that camera has all the features you need? So I totally understand that, of course, there's input wanted on a particular piece of equipment of photography gear, but don't focus too much on that gear. Try to remember that a whole lot of what makes a great fo photograph is the composition, is all those other decisions you make as a photographer, both related to the settings for your gear, but also how you position yourself and how you put that gear to use. And so it came to mind as I was preparing this presentation because several photographers asked me about a lens that I was using in the Palouse. Uh, this happened to be the Tamron 18 to 400 millimeter lens. And so this shot was captured as a crop duster was way off in the distance at 400 millimeters. And then as the crop duster was closer, I was able to capture this image at 50 millimeters. And then as the crop duster got closer still, off to the side of me, thankfully, I was able to capture another interesting angle with an 18 millimeter focal length. So in this case, using that full range from 18 millimeters all the way to 400 millimeters. And so I sort of chuckled when I was asked about this lens because I thought, boy, <laughs> the utility here is fabulous to be able to go from a 400 millimeter shot to a 50 millimeter shot to an 18 millimeter shot without having to change lenses that's pretty incredible. And so I think forgetting that sometimes that utility is more important than other features, you know, maybe this isn't uh, the sharpest lens or, you know, whatever the case might be, whatever attributes might be a concern for you with a particular piece of equipment, remembering that there is still utility in that. So trying to be careful about your decisions on gear and trying to remember how you're going to put that gear to use and not focusing too much on that. So remember that it's all really about the photos that you're able to capture. Some of that gear can be important. There's no question if you're a bird photographer, for example, you're going to need a really long lens with a lot of reach, but not focusing too much on the gear to the exclusion of all of the other factors in photography. And speaking of gear and lenses, I find that many photographers have a tendency to sort of stick to one end of the range when it comes to focal length. 
They're either always shooting everything wide, in other words, a wide-angle lens, a wide field of view, including lots in the frame, or they're always shooting long, using long focal lengths to bring in a distant subject or kind of tighten up that composition. Now, to be sure, one or the other could always work depending on the circumstances. If you tend to do a lot of landscapes, there's a good chance you do a lot of wide-angle photography. If you're doing bird photography, as I mentioned, you're probably using longer lenses. But try to remember to change things up periodically, to photograph a wide landscape, but then also the detail within that landscape. Or to photograph a bird close up, but then also including that bird in a broader landscape. So trying to make sure that you're changing things up a little bit. I find that many photographers sort of get caught in a rut of always shooting wide, and so then they're always including a little bit too much in the frame, or they don't have a strong foreground where they would have been better off shooting a little bit tighter on that scene. I also find that many photographers have a tendency to keep that ISO setting a bit too low, that they always want the ISO setting at 100, for example. They'll never raise it above 400. And granted, I certainly don't want any noise in my photo. That said, today's cameras do a pretty remarkable job of minimizing noise in the capture, even at moderately high ISO settings. Naturally, it's important that you understand the behavior of your camera so that you have a good sense of what ISO setting is starting to be too much of a compromise. But at the same time, <clears throat> keep in mind that it is better to have a little bit of noise than to have a photo that is blurry from motion blur. So if you're handheld and low light, then you're going to need to raise that ISO setting so that you can get a sharp image. And even on a tripod, you might experience really windy conditions. So for example, during this Palouse Photo Workshop, we were up at the top of Steptoe Butte. You're about a thousand feet above the landscape around you. And so it's always a little bit more windy there than it is down below. And sometimes that means a lot of wind. And so even with the tripod, you might see that that camera is shaking around a little. That lens is just quivering in the wind, raising the ISO setting so that you can get a faster shutter speed, even on a tripod, can be tremendously helpful. And if you're only going up to 400 or maybe 800 ISO, there's a really good chance that that noise is going to be minimal, that it's not going to be significant. It will be easy to mitigate in post-processing. So yes, whenever possible, keep that ISO setting as low as possible, but don't be afraid to raise that ISO higher when the situation warrants it. <clears throat> I also find that many photographers kind of get into compositional ruts so I, I gave you those examples of getting caught up with always wide or always long lenses. But there's also, I think, a tendency to sort of compose consistently, a little too consistently maybe, where you're, in many respects, almost taking the same type of photo over and over again. So some of this relates to what I mentioned before, you know, kind of looking around the corner and figuring out or changing your angle. Don't just photograph from the first spot where you noticed a subject but really exploring, really working with a subject or a scene to try to figure out what else you can do. So here, for example, a red barn, late afternoon light with some wheat in the foreground, a pretty straightforward composition. I would call this kind of a standard composition, rule of thirds and all that good stuff, pretty straightforward. And it certainly shows off the subject, gives you a sense of what that old barn looks like. But what other kinds of views can we get? And in this case, just going back down the road a little bit, the exact same barn photographed from down the road at a bit of a distance, and now we have really a completely different image where the barn is sort of nestled among the hills and partially hidden behind a hill. And so trying to really stretch your mind a little bit when it comes to composition to make sure that you're being as creative as you possibly can. Sometimes it's not going to work. Sometimes you'll try something out, you'll experiment a little bit, and you know it just won't work. So you try to get away from the rule of thirds and you're gonna bullseye the subject. Sometimes that works, having the subject right in the center of the frame, and sometimes it doesn't. But don't be afraid to try it out, to play with your compositions just a little bit. Along the way, when you review your photos later, you'll get a sense of what didn't work and what did work and hopefully why the things that didn't work didn't so that you can improve upon that. Because just because you tried a particular technique, for example, with one subject and it didn't work, it 
doesn't mean that that same technique wouldn't work with a different subject in a different location, for example. So try to make sure that you're not getting in those kind of compositional ruts where you're just creating the same types of compositions over and over again. Try to change things up every now and then and kind of have fun. When the time allows for you to sort of explore a subject and get at different angles, different perspectives, try to play with that and see if you can find a variety of different angles for a given subject. It'll be good practice that'll help you with other compositional concepts as well. And then, you know, I find that many photographers, and it's interesting when I'm leading photo workshops to see how different photographers react to different circumstances and whether or not they have a tendency to sort of give up. And what I mean by that is, you know, we go out and it's raining. Nobody really necessarily wants to be out in the rain, but there's potentially some good photos that could be had in the rain. So when the conditions are not ideal, of course, in some cases, it might mean let's pack it up and go inside and have a cup of coffee and talk about photography for a little while or do something completely different and let's return on another day. So we've got a, a dreary, rainy day in the Palouse. It's not exactly ideal for landscapes, but there's certainly other subjects that we could focus on. So, for example, finding some wildflowers that have just been rained upon and so we've got nice water droplets on those flowers we've got nice soft light thanks to that overcast sky and so now we're able to capture images that during the day would not have been as good so the conditions are bad so to speak but we can actually get better photos on a bad day than we might have gotten on a good day in other words the conditions that are good for one type of subject might not be the right conditions for another type of subject or in this case, being able to go into someone's garden and photograph again right after a rain. What are we going to do in the rain? Well, let's go find some flowers. Or on a windy day, if you're photographing flowers on a windy day, you are going to have a tough day because those flowers are just going to be bouncing around and it's going to be very difficult to get the photo that you're after. But what about embracing that wind? In fact, out in the Palouse, if there's some canola fields that are in bloom, if we've got strong winds, I'm going to seek out that canola field and then capture some slightly long exposures so that I can get this blur, this kind of painting of color. So the yellow canola flowers against a blue sky with a lot of wind. So the flowers are just dancing around with a moderately long exposure. In this case, just shy of a one second exposure. And so being able to embrace those conditions that were maybe presenting a bit of a challenge, maybe reducing the degree of uh, sort of inspiration you were feeling or motivation that you were feeling to get out there. You might not have felt like it was necessarily worth going out in the rain and the wind, but in those sort of adverse conditions, you might find that you get some great photos. I also suggest, especially you know, in tricky scenarios, so at night, here obviously not the Palouse, this would be New York City, but photographing at night Sometimes the camera will have a more difficult time establishing autofocus, or it might establish autofocus off just a little bit. Uh, if you don't have very much contrast, so we see this a lot, you know, late afternoon light with landscapes, and if you don't have really strong contrast on a bit of a hazy day, for example, the camera might search a little bit, trying to establish focus automatically. And sometimes it can be tricky. So during the daytime, you might just trust the autofocus. Hopefully you've gotten a sense of how accurate your autofocus system is. And so then you can just use autofocus and not worry about it. But under tricky circumstances, and especially at night when there's low light, then I will manually focus. And in fact, my preference is to use the live view display and zoom in, not with the lens, but with that live view display and use that as the basis of a manual focus. So I'm zoomed in typically at a 10x factor on that LCD display on the camera and then manually adjusting focus to get it exactly where I want it to help ensure the sharpest image is possible. I also find that, uh, well, okay, anyone who has spent any time with me out in the field photographing knows that more often than not, I'm not using a tripod, but there are circumstances when it is absolutely necessary. Now, certainly there are photographers who use a tripod for virtually every single photo. I certainly respect that, but it's not necessary in many cases. That said, here, uh, I believe this was either a 20 or a 30 second exposure of the main coast. I needed a tripod. There's no way I could ever hope to handhold for one second, let alone 30 seconds. And so in a situation like that, recognizing when a tripod is necessary or 
recognizing when a tripod makes a shot possible that might have otherwise been impossible. So you certainly could have captured this scene without the use of a tripod. Just handhold and use a relatively moderately fast shutter speed. But then you can't get that long exposure blur effect on the water. And so if you didn't even get your tripod out, you might not even ever try to capture a long exposure version of the scene as opposed to the faster shutter speed. And so using a tripod when it's necessary, but also recognizing when you might want to have that tripod ready because it's going to make some things possible that otherwise would have been impossible or at least very difficult. Having said all that, I also think that it can be a mistake to always use a tripod, in part because it just doesn't give you as much flexibility. To be sure, a tripod can absolutely help ensure that you're getting a sharper image for a variety of reasons, mostly related to camera movement. But that said, sometimes a tripod is going to hold you back a little bit. So here, I was photographing late afternoon. The sun is just about to go down below the hills that are in the distance here. You can see, of course, the rays of the sun. And if I was using a tripod, I really don't think that I would have been able to readjust my composition as quickly as I did. I had been shooting a wide scene with a very wide angle lens, and then I wanted to shift to a closer view of the wheat getting backlit in the foreground with a little bit of context in the background, the dirt road going off in the distance and the sun just out of the frame. And with the sun going down, things were changing pretty quickly. I'm not sure that I could have adjusted my composition, adjusted the length of the tripod legs and getting everything right into the right position and adjusting my composition and got the shot. I think I might have missed it in this case because the tripod would have slowed me down. Obviously this is late afternoon light, but you know it's reasonably low light, but of course we've got the backlighting so we get a fair bit of light in areas of the scene. But raising that ISO just a little bit and again leveraging that lack of a tripod, not getting reckless where I'm getting slow shutter speeds and not able to get the shot for other reasons. But in many cases, I find that I just am able to work a lot more quickly without a tripod. So I know we're supposed to use a tripod for every shot theoretically, but I find that very often that tripod slows me down. And so I'd rather photograph handheld if at all possible, if the situation warrants it, if I'm able to get a good shot handheld. I also find that many photographers sort of ignore the aperture or they're not as familiar as they maybe should be when it comes to adjusting the lens aperture size. I mean, how many times have we heard, you know, F8 and being there, just set your lens aperture to F8 and you're good to go. Just leave it there and shoot away. But obviously F8 is not always the right lens aperture to use. It's a good standard option, I suppose. Many of us are familiar with minimizing diffraction by stopping down one or two stops, and so for many lenses that might put you right about f8. But f8 is not a magic number that works for every scenario. It certainly works in some cases, but not so much others. So shooting wide open here, for example, using a long lens and shooting wide open to get very narrow depth of field so that the flowers in the distance are just a wash of color. There's even flowers in the foreground that are providing a wash of color. But my key subject not only is still in focus, but now is isolated by focus, stands out because it's essentially the only thing in focus. So shooting wide open sometimes. In other cases, stopping down completely because I want as much depth of field as I possibly can get. I want the canola flowers really close to my lens to be sharp, and I want those canola flowers and the clouds way off in the distance to be sharp as well. So I want maximum depth of field. Here I was focusing relatively close to my subject, so I've really got to stop down in order to get that depth of field. F8 would not have worked as well. In addition, there might be some controversy on this one to be sure, but every now and then I like to stop down that lens purely for purposes of getting a starburst effect. So being able to have the sun create those rays, or if there's lights in the scene, a night scene, as long as I have the lens stopped down to a small size, so something like f16 or f22, and I've got what I call a crisp light source or a non-diffused light source in the frame, then I should be able to get that starburst effect. So at sunset, you'll see here, there aren't rays going up above the sun because there's so much haze there, but the sun being set against those hills gives that a crisp edge along the hill. And so that gives me rays down at the bottom while not at the top. 
But again, thinking about that, and maybe if you don't like the starburst effect, then you will avoid stopping down to F16 or F22 when you've got a crisp light source in the frame. Being aware of it, though, first and foremost, understanding how your gear works and what different settings will give you in terms of results. But really, more importantly, in this case, just not ignoring that aperture, not just kind of setting it and forgetting it. Think about how much depth of field you want. Keep in mind the impact of focusing close. When you're very close to a subject, you're not going to be able to get a lot of depth of field. When you're focusing at a great distance, you're essentially always going to have a lot of depth of field. And when you're in that kind of mid-range in between, then you've got a lot more creative control. But again, the key is to be aware of that and to exercise that creative control. Also, using fast shutter speed. So out in the Palouse, we've got a, a good friend of mine who is a crop duster and coordinates with us so that we can safely get out there and photograph him as he's working the fields, spraying the fields. But when I'm approaching, on our way there, I'll be talking to the photographers about what to expect, and I'll ask what sort of shutter speed they think they're going to need, and the answer is usually either something like a thousandth of a second or as fast as possible. But as you can see here, with a propeller-driven aircraft, when you use a very fast shutter speed, that propeller gets frozen and it makes it look like that pilot is having a very bad day. So instead, we want to use a little bit of a slower shutter speed. So being thoughtful, certainly with a moving subject, here a fast moving subject flying along at something like 100 miles an hour above the field, we need a fast shutter speed to freeze that action, except then we're going to freeze the propeller. So going down to maybe about a 2 50th of a second or a 3 50th of a second, somewhere in that range, as a maximum in this particular example, will help ensure that you have at least a little bit of blur for that propeller. And so, not always, just because you have fast action, speeding up your shutter speed. The canola flowers that I showed you earlier with the wind, I might have said, well, I just need a really, really fast shutter speed and then I could freeze the motion, except why not embrace that motion? So here, the propeller turning is certainly a motion that the pilot would want to embrace, and so I think as photographers, we ought to embrace that as well. So being more thoughtful about what sort of camera settings, in this case, shutter speed, obviously can be very helpful. I also find that many photographers, it's an old mantra, right, that there's no photographs can be captured at noon. At high noon, there's just not any images to be found. Now, to be fair, of course, I generally prefer early light or late light. I love that golden light and the color that it gives to the scene. But that said, you can capture photos under just about any conditions and at just about any time, including high noon. Now, full disclosure, this image of Fallon, the adorable horse, was actually captured at 1.06 p.m. So not high noon, but pretty darn close. And at a time when you might otherwise say, it's time to get lunch and take a nap. And certainly, in the Palouse, when sunrise comes at around 5 a.m. and the sunset is just before 9 p.m., a midday lunch break and nap break certainly is a good idea. But don't get caught in that trap of thinking that you can't capture great photos in the middle of the day. You might need to change your approach a little bit, find different subjects, find scenes that work with high contrast, for example. But there are always photos, I believe, that can be captured at just about any time and under just about any circumstances if you look hard enough. I've also noticed, especially photographers who have a tendency to use a tripod, that they tend to get sort of locked into either always shooting horizontally or always shooting vertically. And in many cases, I think you'll find that with a given subject, either option might work. I always like to joke, you know, if you're always shooting horizontal, don't forget to shoot vertical periodically for magazine covers. But the idea is to just change things up, to explore different possibilities. So here, a scene that certainly works horizontally, but it might work in a vertical orientation as well, sort of emphasizing the foreground detail, for example, rather than the broader landscape. So again, as with everything, being mindful, and it doesn't mean just automatically every time you capture an image, then flip the camera to vertical instead of horizontal and capture the same scene again, or always capture with lots of depth of field and then open up the aperture and capture with narrow depth of field, but rather to be mindful about how you might want to photograph a scene or a subject and thinking about what options. You know, what things do you not change all that often with your camera, such as orientation? Are you sort of always capturing horizontally? And might it make sense to sometimes capture vertically as well? Now, this is a funny one to me because 
I hear so often, don't chimp, that you're not supposed to look at the back of the camera, the LCD display, you're not supposed to review your photos in the field, and yet I would say that there's so much value to be had. Now, you don't want to miss a shot because you were reviewing a photo, but maybe taking a look at that histogram and seeing, am I blowing out any highlight detail, and if so, where in the image and to what extent, or do I need to, you know, take a different approach, adjust my exposure, apply exposure compensation? So what I usually try to do, if possible, if the situation allows it, is to quickly capture a test shot. It doesn't have to be a great composition, but just that is representative of the scene I'm intending to photograph and seeing, you know, is my exposure working? If I'm applying exposure compensation because I think I'm smarter than the camera's meter, did that actually work out? Sometimes it's true and I was smarter and my compensation is good. Sometimes I was off and I missed it and I need to make adjustments. So not ignoring, make sure not to ignore the histogram and maybe even reviewing composition, getting a sense of how the images are working out and what you might want to modify. But, you know, when it comes to exposure, obviously that histogram is a key to make sure that you're retaining detail in both the highlights and the shadows. And if you're not, be sure that you don't neglect to bracket the scene. And so especially with strong contrast, so late afternoon light, we've got deep shadows and maybe some bright light. Here, an extreme case, including the sun in the frame. And so I've got a very, very bright sky and a very dark foreground. If I, ex if I expose for the foreground, I might completely blow out the sky. So remember that we can bracket those exposures. And bracketing is sort of twofold. Number one, if you're needing to work kind of quickly because that sun's going down fast and you've got to get your shot, you might want to bracket just to help ensure that you get a good exposure. If you're not completely confident in your ability to fine-tune the exposure, then set some bracketing so that you'll have options to look at later. And I think more importantly, perhaps, the other aspect of bracketing is that then we can take those bracketed images, so a very dark image, a lighter image, a lighter still image, and then a very bright image, you might say, so that we have the full range of tonal values in the scene, the very brights to the very darks all included within those bracketed exposures, because then we can combine the results. So instead of having a single image where we're compromising on the level of detail in the scene, we can bracket those exposures and assemble those images into an HDR result. So bracketing both to kind of help you make sure that you get the shot and to help give you that option of creating a high dynamic range or HDR image in post-processing where you're able to present a scene with much more detail than would have been possible with a single shot. I also find that many photographers have a tendency not to plan ahead. So I'm going to give you two photos that represent the same basic example of planning ahead just a little bit more. And obviously, when it comes to planning, sometimes that means planning for the locations you want to photograph, maybe to some extent planning for the compositions or the types of images that you want to capture, planning for time of day, what time is sunrise and what time is sunset. Or what's the weather going to be like and what do I need to do to adjust my plan accordingly? Or, as you see here, planning for the full moon. So the rise of the full moon. This was during a photo workshop I was leading in Rome, Italy. And I knew that we would have a full moon during the week of that particular workshop. And so I wanted to figure out what would be the best vantage point. Well, first, I need to know where the moon is actually going to rise. Well, first, I guess I need to know the day and time that that moon is going to rise as a full moon or set as a full moon. And so then figuring out where I can be. So I use the photographer's ephemeris. Uh, there's a web version as well as an app. There's other tools for this type of purpose as well. But to plot on a map where the moon was going to be, in this case, rising as a full moon, and therefore, using that line that shows me from a point on a map to where the moon will be, I can adjust that point on a map and see if I'm in this particular location. So this is on a hilltop out to the west of Rome, of the main old part of central Rome. And so we've got a nice view of the old part of Rome, and we can then plot from here where that moon was going to rise, and so I was able to pick and choose. So I thought, well, maybe we, if we go on top of the Altare della Patria that you see on the left side of the frame, that large white structure on the left side of the frame, maybe that would be interesting. But then looking at the map and seeing where that line to the moon extended, 
there wasn't much in the way of interesting subject matter in that position. So moving around on the map and figuring out what would be a good position to observe and photograph that moonrise, and I decided upon this area, uh, the Janikolo hilltop, and so being able to know where that moon was going to rise so that we could frame up the scene and have, I think, an interesting perspective on Rome with that full moon rising over the hills in the distance. And same basic thing in the Palouse a couple of years ago. It just so happened that a full moon fell on one of our workshop weeks. And so I, did, I went through the same basic process and figured out. And there was a little trickier because the moon was going to be setting at sunrise, just after sunrise. And so where could we go to have the moon in the frame at sunrise, but also have an interesting subject. Well, fortunately, it worked out that one of the barns that I like to photograph at sunrise provided a good vantage point where I could have the full moon in the sky behind the barn, and all of that thanks to planning. Of course, that planning is going to be frustrated at some point because whenever anybody sees a photo like this, there's a good chance they're gonna ask if it's a composite, but you'll know that it was your planning that made that photo possible. That said, let's not ignore the role of luck when it comes to capturing a photographic image. I am a big planner, and especially when I'm leading a photo workshop, I plan a little bit obsessively, you might say. And so when the weather becomes a challenge, my planning becomes a challenge as well. So I was leading a photo workshop in New York City, and we had a little bit of bad weather during the week. In fact, one of the days, there were extreme thunderstorms forecast for one of our afternoons. And so I obsessively monitored the weather and realized that there was a window both before and after those thunderstorms would strike that we could get some photos. And so we went to Brooklyn and got out there well ahead of the storm passing through. Well, well, well ahead, that's a relative term. But getting out there ahead of the storm we got some late afternoon shots, then we ducked into a restaurant, enjoyed a nice dinner, and lingered for a little bit longer while the downpour was happening. And then once the rain lightened up, we moved positions to a coffee shop that gave us a vantage point of the area that we would be photographing. So here at Brooklyn Bridge Park, you can see Brooklyn Bridge in the foreground and photographing the Manhattan skyline. And as the storm passed, the sky just started to light up, and the color was just glorious. It was incredible. Just to stand there and be able to observe this was absolutely remarkable, but to be able to photograph it as well was even better. And so we enjoyed this amazing color in the sky, creating these silhouette-type shots of the Manhattan skyline with amazing color in the background. And of course, you can see it's a dark scene, it's a backlit scene, and so it seems like HDR might be a good option. And so Everyone else was pretty well occupied. I set up my camera for bracketed exposures, relatively long exposures, a couple seconds probably was the, the main, the base exposure, and I set about letting it capture multiple captures bracketed in that manner as I went up and down the line of photographers checking to make sure everybody had what they need. Of course, they were so engrossed in what they were doing, they didn't need me at all. And then, a bolt of lightning. And it just so happens that during my middle exposure of an HDR bracketed sequence, that lightning bolt struck. And so I actually had that capture purely, completely by luck. Now, to be fair, there was a whole lot of planning, detailed planning and revising of, the, of those plans that went into getting the photographic opportunity in the first place, working around these thunderstorms. But then I just got absolutely lucky when it came to actually capturing an image that includes a lightning bolt above the World Trade Center tower. So don't dismiss the potential role of luck in capturing an image. Luck, I'll take it. I'll be more than happy to accept the role of luck in my photographic images. All right, so that covers all of those tips. Now I'm sure you might have some other tips some lessons that you've learned over the years, maybe some questions that you'd like to ask as follow-ups. I'll be happy to address those. Uh, we do have a few here. Oh, good question from Tom. Uh, comment on focus stacking. Well, that would have been a good tip for me to include, especially as I was talking about depth of field. Uh, so we can learn from each other. So one of the uh, participants here, Tom says, what about focus stacking? And it's funny because some of the newer cameras now have automatic focus stacking, just like exposure bracketing. 
and that enables you to increase depth of field. So when we're working with a situation such as close-up photography where depth of field can be a real challenge, absolutely you can stack multiple exposures where the focus point is shifted and create greater depth of field. That works much better for close-up subjects than it does for slightly more distant subjects, but it can be absolutely incredible in terms of taking those images and assembling them later and creating depth of field that would have been otherwise absolutely impossible with a single capture, even if you were able to maximize, you know, to stop down the lens aperture all the way. And Tom also asked about the app. I think that was the Photographer's Ephemeris. I do have a lesson that I think has not been published, so we will get something out on that soon. In fact, maybe we'll do that as an upcoming webinar, talking about some of that planning, more detailed planning, so that I can show you some of those tools you can use to get a better sense of how to plan for things like where the sun and moon are going to be. Uh, so, And Jack asked, the, you know, the, what's the best way to shoot HDR or high dynamic range? And the key, of course, is to include the full tonal range in the scene. So making sure that we're covering all the way from the brightest highlights to the darkest shadows, if at all possible. And I generally use automatic exposure bracketing. With most cameras, if you enable automatic exposure bracketing and you enable a two-second timer for that exposure, then when you capture the image, it'll be a two-second delay, but then all of the images in that bracket will be captured in rapid succession. And I generally separate each of the exposures by two stops. In many cases, if your camera is limited to just three exposures for bracketing, two stops in between. Number one, that'll work out great for the HDR, but it also will generally give you a good range, meaning it'll cover the full range in many cases. Of course, there are exceptions where you need maybe five, sometimes even seven exposures to be able to get everything in the frame, depending on the circumstances. Uh, so actually, a really great question from uh, Seth here about photographing, and particularly in the Palouse, and this is a key thing that's come up, not exactly related to, well, I guess this is a mistake to avoid. Don't encroach on private property if you don't have permission. So the question relates to how we go around in the Palouse and photograph some of these subjects. Do we stay on the road? Or are we able to go into the fields? And the key is that we do not enter private property, nor should you, without permission. There are certainly many cases where we do get permission from the owners and we can go into the private property. But if you don't have that permission, please respect the private property of those farmers out there. As a general rule, they're more than happy to let you enter their property if it's safe to do so. In many cases, it's not a problem at all, but they have a big problem with photographers not asking permission in the first place. All right. Uh, a real good question from Sam. Do I find that photographers ignore either the foreground or the background when capturing images? Yes, absolutely. And so one of the best examples of that, I think, is with wide-angle photography, there's a tendency to ignore the foreground. You've got such a wide field of view, you're kind of just focused on the fact that there's everything here in the scene, and you neglect the foreground, but that's the entry point for the viewer. And similarly, you've got a great foreground, but then the background is kind of blah, or it's got a lot of distractions and blemishes. And so there's no question, and even that mid-ground, there very often, you know, there's this concept of having a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. Uh, so with the photo you see here before you, the foreground would be that one hill in the foreground with texture that shows us, at least to some extent, that this is a wheat field. And then the sun would be the background, and the middle ground would be the dust cloud above the dirt road and the hills there. And so absolutely trying to focus on the entire frame, looking all the way around the frame and all throughout the scene, foreground, middle ground, background, to make sure that you're taking all of those factors into account. Uh, so Bob asked a great question. Uh, he, Bob joined me on a previous workshop out in the Palouse. It was great having him there with us. And asked if there are suggestions for improving composition skills. And so there'd be two items there that I would say. One of those I was sort of alluding to with some of these various examples is kind of getting out there and just trying stuff. Think about, you know, if you have some, some time on your hands with a subject that you'd be interested in photographing where the timing's not critical, you just kind of have some time available to capture some photos, try and find a dozen different ways to photograph that subject in an interesting way. So just getting out there and experimenting and trying things and practicing. And then the other is absolutely, so he mentions, you know, looking at books or videos. 
one thing that I actually recommend as a, a good option is to go look at paintings. I like to joke that painters have it easy because they don't have to deal with what the scene really looks like. They can make it look however they want it to look. Of course, the caveat there is they have to actually be able to paint. I couldn't paint to save my life, which is why I'm a photographer, not a painter. But go look at paintings because there the photographer, oh, the painter, the artist, was able to create the image as they wanted it to be. So if you look at a painting, conceptually that's an idealized view of the scene or subject. And I find that that can be very helpful to get some ideas for how you might approach a photographic scene. There tends not to be as much, I think, in the way of variation when it comes to perspective, perhaps, although I'm not sure that's necessarily entirely true. But it, obviously paintings are different from photos, but looking at paintings, and of course looking at other photographers' work, can absolutely be helpful. You'll find what you like and what you don't like, what resonates versus doesn't resonate, and I'm sure along the way you'll come up with some creative ideas as well. Uh, so Jack asks if I get better results for those HDRs with specific software versus manual blending. Almost without exception, I get better results with HDR software. That said, there are some scenarios where it just would not go together. I've had situations that include a full moon, for example, that were very HDR, very high dynamic range scenarios, and HDR software just could not get the moon to look good, and so I had to actually use layer masking to composite those different exposures. So as a general rule, HDR software will give you better results than blending manually. That said, there are certainly situations where you might find that we're needing to use a manual approach instead. Uh, Philip mentions PhotoPills app for night and star photography. That's one I just learned about. I've got it installed but haven't taken a look at yet, but I'll certainly be talking about that at some point in the future. Uh, Trish throws in an additional thought here about not including everything in a photo. Try to keep it simple, and that is absolutely great advice, something I talk about pretty frequently when it comes to compositions. Try seeing what is really important here, what do I want to include, and what might be just more of a distraction. Oh, so George mentions that uh, all of those, I just added fuel to the fire for those who think that a tripod is their enemy uh, and that for a long time landscape photographer such as George, you should never head out without your tripod. And I actually completely agree with that. As much as I don't always use my tripod, I, I often say you should use your tripod. I just don't often use my tripod unless it's needed, but I try to absolutely always have that tripod with me. And I do have the utmost respect for photographers who have the patience and the, the quick adjustment skills to get a shot in any circumstances using a tripod. I've had many photographers on my workshops who use a tripod for every single image, and guess what? They are often the photographers who come away with some of the best images. I also capture many of my images without a tripod, and I'm happy with the results I'm getting. So, you know, I certainly don't want to discourage you from using a tripod, but I also don't want you to get necessarily in that trap sort of of always using a tripod, especially in those situations where that might slow you down just a little bit. All right, let's see here. Oh yeah, so Ephemeris, I talked about that, and PhotoPills, both great options that I will be talking. I think we'll have to do a webinar on that specific topic in the future. And let's see, what else have we got here? Uh, variable ND filters. Uh, great question, Dave. So is it worthwhile to use a variable ND filter as opposed to a solid neutral density filter? My personal take is I prefer a solid neutral density filter rather than a variable neutral density filter. I absolutely appreciate that a variable filter will give you ranges something on the order of you know one stop all the way up to maybe around 10 stops depending on the particular filter. That's incredible utility. The challenges are a couple. Number one is that it's very difficult to predict exactly what the compensation needs to be for a given setting on that variable filter. And also, the way they work, you'll sometimes get cross-polarization effects in the image. You get these gradations, kind of an X shape in the image, uh, especially with wider views. And so my personal preference is to use a solid neutral density filter, relatively strong neutral density filter. Keeping in mind, I'll very often use a 6 or a 10 stop filter, for example. I can always raise the ISO a little bit, or maybe open the aperture up a little bit if I need a different setting in terms of, for example, the shutter speed. 
Uh, but personally, I just tend not to prefer the use of those variable neutral density filters as opposed to a solid, a fixed neutral density filter, you might say. All right, that's all the time that we've got for today. Thank you so much. I hope you found today's presentation helpful, maybe even a little bit inspirational. I do want to once again thank Tamron for sponsoring, making this presentation possible. Be sure to check out their videos, one that may feature me very soon at youtube.com slash tamronvids. And also note that if you're not already a subscriber to the Gray Learning Ultimate Bundle, you can get access to all of the video courses that I've published on photography, Lightroom, Photoshop, etc., and save 33% in the process. Just go to timgray.me slash graybundle99. Thank you once again for joining me today. I hope to see you on a future presentation as part of the Gray Learning webinar series sponsored by Tamron. Thanks very much.